Uh, before I start, I want to uh, give credit where credit is due by acknowledging that um, in several places in this talk, I've incorporated and adapted some lines of poetry that were originally written by the well-known poets William Butler Yeats and T.S. Eliot, and especially by the late John H. Stone, who was an eloquent writer and a cardiologist uh, at Emory University. All right, let's begin. I join the other faculty members in the administration uh, in welcoming the class of 2015 to Albert Einstein College of Medicine. For me personally, it's a privilege to be here with you and with your family and friends. I've titled this talk, Great Expectations, not because I plan to discuss the novel by Charles Dickens, um, but because I want to discuss three questions with you uh, that have to do with expectations. First, what should you expect of the medical school experience? Second, what do we expect of you while you're here? And third, what should you expect of yourself? Well, as to the last question, if you expect to find yourself here, as the expression goes, I have to tell you we make no guarantees. Uh, but I guarantee you that in order to succeed in medical school, you must lose yourself. You must lose yourself in the work, and more importantly, you must lose yourself in the amazing experiences you're going to have in the coming years. In fact, medical school will be so transformative that you will emerge a different person from the one who sits here today. So what will it be like? In the beginning, it will seem a lot like college, only more intense, sort of like college on steroids. A lot of lectures, syllabus upon syllabus, discussion groups and examinations, and yes, I hate to admit it, tedium. Pathways and structures and molecules. But right away, you'll recognize that it's not just more college, because for one thing, you'll be learning anatomy uh, through the time-honored method of dissecting a human cadaver, uh, a cadaver that I know you will treat with the utmost respect. You'll experience the exhilaration of finally knowing about medical things you've heard about all your life, but never really understood. Things like insulin and diabetes and heart attack and stroke, You'll learn long, complicated disease names with which to impress your friends and family back at home. Waldenstrom macroglobulinemia, posseimmune diffuse proliferative glomerulonephritis, hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis. Oh, th 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 that one's really good. In the first two years, some of what you study will seem irrelevant. It is not. Like those who came before you, you will memorize and then forget the details of glycolysis and the Krebs cycle, and you won't worry at the time about having forgotten them. But later when you have a patient who has lymphoma, who is generating excess lactic acid, or you have a patient with muscle dysfunction due to a mutation in one of the enzymes of oxidative phosphorylation, you'll wish you'd learned your biochemistry better. Store up your grains of knowing against the days and nights of need which lie ahead. The halfway point of medical school will, for the most part, mark the end of the many examinations that had seemed endless. Celebrate. 
celebrate. But remember, after examination comes testing. Now, because now you will immerse in the world of patient care, which is a world of deep responsibility amounting to a sacred trust between you on the one hand and your patients and their loved ones on the other. But strange as it may sound, at the same time that you are thrust into this world of responsibility, you will suddenly feel as if somehow, despite two years of very hard studying, you've managed to learn very little. I say this because although the clinical clerkships are still a world of pathways and structures and molecules, they are also a world of symptoms, laboratory tests, diagnosis, and treatment. You'll have to reprocess your knowledge from the first two years and incorporate it into a new synthesis for dealing with patients. This can take a while. In the meanwhile, you will look smart, but feel ignorant. Don't panic. On our end, we will bring you into this new role very carefully, and you will never be left alone. On your end, I think the best plan is to once again lose yourself in the hard work and the experiences around you Give it your all, do your best. I assure you, it will come together. Every physician in this room was at that point, at the start of their third year, every one of them made it and did fine. We're here, you'll be fine. Your clinical professors will teach you many things. But increasingly, you'll start to learn from your patients and your peers. You'll not be answering questions on exams, but rather you'll be answering questions asked by patients. Doctor, what do I have? What will happen to me? What caused my illness? Some patients already know the answer to the question, even though they have a disease that just peers up over the hedge of health with only its eyes showing. The family may know the answers to the question, even if the patient does not. Or there may be no answer, and once again, you'll know too little. Or there will be an answer, and upon hearing it, you'll lose your virginity because now you'll know too much forever. During the clinical years, you may be lucky enough to rotate through one of our programs in Africa, where you will encounter squalor and poverty, neglect and advanced disease, and you will finally feel authentic when they call you doctor, even though you're still a student. But at the end of your exploring, you will arrive where you started and know the place for the first time, because back home here in the Bronx, you will also encounter squalor, poverty, neglect, and advanced disease, and you will finally understand that you were the doctor for your patients here all along. You will encounter the mysteries of medicine. For example, sometimes when the patient lives, you'll try to understand how and why, because frankly, you will be amazed that they lived. At other times, all the consultants will be unable to help you. You will be unable to save the patient. The patient will die. And you will try to understand why, for you will be baffled. You may be the one who will explain the outcome to the family. But how to explain death? When you know, please tell the rest of us, because no matter how much learning you acquire, no matter how long you practice medicine, 
life and death remain forever a mystery. In addition to the mysteries, there are the mistakes. In these digital days, we often focus on our iPhones and our Blackberries and our tweets more than we focus on the actual living, breathing people around us. And so you too will focus on the computer screen. And don't get me wrong, the test results there will tell you much of value. But in focusing solely on the test results, you will forget to go back often to look at the patient. In this way, the trivial will trap you and the important will escape you. And so you will make mistakes. Patient care mistakes. Perhaps you won't make any mistakes uh, like this as a medical student, but inevitably, as a physician, you will. My own mistakes are seared into my memory. The man whose ruptured spleen I missed, the young woman whose arterial embolus I failed to manage aggressively enough, if you're appropriately introspective, you'll learn a lot from your medical errors, which is good, but they will come back to you through the years. With time, it seems as if they all come to live, or live together in one room in your mind. The days lapse, the nights remorse. Mostly, though, you'll not make mistakes. You'll do just the right thing, and the patient will improve. The lungs will clear, the pain decline, the appetite return. Children who only yesterday lay listless in bed will run the hallways once again. Women will put on the pink slippers they had brought with them but had had no need to wear. Men will shave off the grizzled growth. Then there will be days of delight and elevators of elation, and you will walk triumphantly in purest joy along the halls of the hospital and say yes to all the dark corners where no one is listening. And slowly you will start to appreciate what is called the art of medicine. By that I mean after you learn what to do and how and when to do it, then you will be ready to try to learn whether. This question will occupy you for life. By the art of medicine, I also mean that you will learn the healing power of sitting on the edge of the bed, of quietly holding a hand, of listening for what I'll call the patient's voice which is to say the patient's story beyond the medical history. The patient's voice is about careers, loves, losses, regrets, hopes, idealism, passion. If you listen for that voice, it will tell you how another human life is being lived. This is one of the greatest gifts that a life in medicine has to offer you. You must give all of your attention to your patients when you are with them. Very brief is the time in which you can help them, in which their happiness or misery is decided. The writer Anatole Broyard was faced with metastatic cancer. He said, to the typical physician, my illness is a routine incident on rounds, while for me, it's the crisis of my life. I would feel better if I had a doctor who bonded with me for a brief space, who surveyed my soul as well as my flesh to get at my illness, for each person is ill in his or her own way. You can give each patient the attention they deserve if you always keep in mind that we are here to serve our patients. Although your class is very diverse ethnically, 
racially and culturally. You are attending a medical school that was established under Jewish auspices and which is part of Yeshiva University. This Jewish heritage brings with it a powerful directive that you should internalize while you're here. Namely, that you are to repair the world. In Hebrew, tikkun olam. Repair the world one patient at a time. Repair the world by serving your patients at their point of greatest fear and suffering. You can serve through clinical care, teaching, or research. But regardless of how you do so, you must always serve with compassion and humanity. And so you will graduate as a physician. When you do, I want you to always remember this. After all the learning is done, after all the pathways and structures and molecules, the differential diagnoses and the CT scans, after all that is mastered, the heart must lead. The head will explain, but the heart is the final common pathway. Because in the end, what matters is how the human spirit is spent. Class of 2015, go forth. <laughs>